Stop asking about it. She didn't have anything to do with it. She wasn't there that morning. She voluntarily cooperated with law enforcement. She provided us all the information. I'm not going to tell you where she's at. Stop. Leave me alone. Because ultimately, she is a victim in ways as well. So right. leave her the hell alone. <laughs> like, right. I mean, leave y'all alone about it. Leave her alone. And out of his own mouth, again, was a very clear affirmation of what he had done. She didn't do it. She had nothing right. to do with it. Leave right. her alone. Right. Absolutely. Hell, I've been accused of accepting bribes <laughs> from her, the mistress, from her family, not to prosecute her. Uh, I'm still waiting for that check. Apparently, I'm getting paid $80,000 not to prosecute her. Uh, Kim, let me know when that check comes through. Yeah, we're putting it towards my student loans. So, wow, that was District Attorney Michael Rourke. And even though that podcast came out months ago with him and his wife and their friend really defending Nicole Kessinger in the Chris Watts case, it is just now getting a bunch of attention. Yeah, because you found yeah. out that you really didn't need to see that, right? Oh, yeah, I found out very. I found out the hard way. Um, Bella and Celeste were, like I said, three and four year old little girls with very long, glowing blonde hair who liked to sit, uh, run around the living room, dance, sing, and do cartwheels. We knew that because we had some social media posts that Shanann had put on her Facebook page or, or Instagram, one of the, one of them. And so I watched those and I saw those little girls and my own daughter at the time was about that same age long blonde hair doing cartwheels at my living room, despite the fact she knows that's a family rule not to. <laughs> and there was an immediate connection that I felt with those little girls because of my daughter. I didn't, I, I couldn't go watch them be extricated from a oil tank. That's because of a new video by the YouTuber named Behind Criminal Minds. It's called Chris Watts, A Deal with the Devil in Search of Justice. I've linked to it below. It's two hours long. I watched the whole thing. So that's how I found out about District Attorney Michael Rourke going on his wife's podcast and all those things he said about Nicole Kessinger. She didn't have anything to do with it. She wasn't there that morning of the fateful, horrible crimes that Chris Watts committed against his beautiful family. She didn't do it. She had nothing to do with it. Leave her alone. I'm not going to tell you where she's at. And Michael Rourke even said he's been apparently getting $80,000 bribes not to prosecute Nicole. At least that's what the fake rumors are saying online. So you can listen to the entire podcast from the links below. It's called A Survivor's Guide to True Crime. It's really well done. The links are below and it's getting quite the reaction. The best part of the podcast is talking about the vicarious trauma that law enforcement and other folks can get when they witness true crime scenes, when they try and deal with the crime scene photos. There's a lot in it to unpack. There's a lot of positivity there. So I want you to talk about it because it's one of your most memorable cases. Just don't make me say his name. All right. Because I refuse to do that. Um, <laughs> I refer to this now as the Frederick homicide case, triple homicide. Yeah. The, the Frederick triple murder happened in August of 2018. And, and it started off with not a lot of notoriety. And, and really the long and the short of it was Shanann had gone on a, a work trip to Phoenix with some of her colleagues. She came home from the airport the night of August 13th of 2018. And we know now had a discussion with the defendant about their marital future. In the very early morning hours of her return from the airport, she and her four-year-old and three-year-old daughter go missing. The defendant, I'm going to continue to refer to him as the defendant, is one of the first, but not the first, to call law enforcement to notify them of their disappearance. He is seen through local media channels standing on his front porch, begging and pleading, and I put that in air quotes, for them to be returned safely, trying to find information, wanting them back, talking about how difficult it is to sleep and to eat, knowing that they have disappeared. And it struck particularly our law enforcement, experienced law enforcement agents, very oddly. And It struck me oddly. I'm watching it happen on the news, and I don't know if it was live or just like the next segment. Right. And you got home in the middle of it. I remember I'm standing at the back of the couch. I was like, oh, he did it. There was nothing, nothing there. Within a couple of days, he is brought into the Frederick Police Department, is interviewed by detectives and agents from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. And after a few hours of some very good interrogation, ultimately admits that he is responsible for their death. 
but some people are glomming on to the hypocrisy, the hubris. I see a lot of hubris and hear a lot of hubris when I listen to this podcast, and you'll see what I mean. And of course, prosecutors have to have a certain amount of, I don't want to say arrogance, they have to have a certain amount of chutzpah, I'd say, to get in there and do their jobs. But at the same time, it's important to listen to your constituents as well. The DA is going to talk about not being a fan of true crime or not consuming true crime podcasts cast and all that stuff. Of course. Well, thank you for coming down to our program. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me on the program. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So two questions left. Two questions. Yep. I already know the answer. <laughs> do you consume true crime? <laughs> That's all I do. That's my entire job. <laughs> my job, my life is true crime. Outside of work. Outside of work. <laughs> so, outside of work. Because this is Survivor's Guide to True Crime, we have to know, do you listen to true crime podcasts? I do not. Um, and and I, I love you both. Um, I'm not going to listen to yours because and I, I don't. We don't. I don't listen to them. I mean, we don't want to listen to ourselves talk either. So it's okay. no, I, I don't. In all seriousness, I don't. And Kim knows the answer to this. I don't come home and read true crime books. I don't come home and read fictional stories about crime or those kinds of things for a variety of reasons. But most notably, this is all I do every day. Um, I go to work and I read police reports and I read charging documents and I read victim impact statements. I don't need to do it at home. And And maybe one A, if that's reason one, one A is I don't need to. What's that? (laughs) Right. A lawyer of you. Oh, I got it. The the answer to your question is it depends. (laughs) Okay. Um, But the other reason I don't know from a prosecutor standpoint, if the true crime story that's being put out, has been authorized by the victim mm-hmm, or if the mm-hmm. victim has participated. And if it hasn't, I am not going to consume that out of respect for that victim and his or her choices. And yeah, I'm, I'm just not going to do it because I'm not going to allow someone to monetize a, a victim suffering for my own entertainment value. All the snaps. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> It must have taken some doing for his wife to get him on here. He recorded this podcast last year, April 2023. And then in June, I also saw he did a TED Talk. So even though he said he had stopped doing interviews for a while, he stopped talking about the Watts case, he even refused to say Chris Watts' name, obviously he's getting back into talking about it, at least in a good way to try and help law enforcement deal with their own trauma and not stuff it like decades ago, like 25 years or more ago, how he described this horrible crime against an 11 year old boy who was found basically frozen. I won't get into gory details. I'll let you listen to it over there. But how it really impacted him, his first trauma response, vicarious trauma. And he was told, just get back in there and deal with it. He was given a stick of gum and told, just get back in there. Feelings be damned. So there's a lot of positivity in this podcast, but some folks are screaming hypocrite and calling out the podcast for other reasons as well. First off, even though my Michael Rourke is not a fan of true crime podcasts. He kind of gets in there. He makes fun of Keith Morrison of Dateline NBC, the stylized podcast and crime shows of today with the music we like to put underneath our voices and all that stuff. And Rourke talks about not being a fan of, you know, monetizing people's pain. These monetized podcasts focused on true crime, and he talks about, in essence, monetizing the victim's pain. Well, ironically, right before they start talking about the Chris Watts case in this podcast, there's like a minute long advertisement. But did you know that it's also adaptogen April? Say what? Do you know what an adaptogen is, Kim? I understand all of those words separately. (laughs) So adaptogens are essentially some type of compound botanical that goes into your body and helps your body deal with stress. It's non-toxic, non-specific, and normalizing. So what it does is it helps regulate your stress hormones and helps you adapt to stress. I have some of that, the stress. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the good news is that Cured, almost all of their products have adaptogens. So it's adapted in April and they are really doing a push on education around adaptogens. And it is genuinely something that makes them extra amazing. My favorite products with adaptogens are the Rise, the Zen and the Aura, but they are also in the Serenity Gummies. That's the ashwagandha that you see there. So if that sounds like something you would like to try, head on over to CuredNutrition.com. Use code CARA10 at checkout to get an extra discount and to support us and let us know what you think. To the case we were talking about earlier, the Frederick case, they made a Lifetime movie out of it. Um, oh, didn't yeah. talk to any of us about it. But there was that and there was a couple of other 
it's the documentaries that you watched that I watched the Netflix one because Netflix, that's right. and that is the only one that I watched to make sure that it was correct. And then I watched because her family was actually involved in that process. And I wanted to, I guess, make sure that it represented everything accurately. And that's the only one that I was like, okay, I'm not hugely pissed off over this because there wasn't the narration. Like, mm-hmm. you know, there wasn't a Keith Morrison with yeah. ominous tones. Sort was of. it murder? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. But it, it didn't have that. Like the story told itself, but still we'll pull up Netflix. We're going to have family movie night. Okay. And there's that face that all the kids know and right. they are very fam- yes dear <laughs> i just have to i'm just sitting here thinking i need to throw a disclaimer on what i said earlier oh god <laughs> because kara asked me if i'd consume true crime or watch it on tv or things like that and i don't but i participate in it and i do so voluntarily and sounds like a lawyer voluntarily and intelligently <laughs> no but i do have a picture of him sitting across from keith morrison keith morrison having his nose powdered. So that may be Patreon content. Now, of course, I see nothing wrong with advertisements. I believe the worker is due their pay. Everything it takes to run a podcast, people don't realize, especially the really nice podcasts. All this equipment, these lights, these cameras, these MacBooks, the editing software, the time, the time it takes to research. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes. I believe people who run podcasts, people who work on Dateline, NBC, whomever, law enforcement, everyone deserves to be paid for their time. That doesn't mean they're profiting off of the person's pain. It just means that's their job. That's what they do. But the irony is this podcast, Survivor's Guide to True Crime, an interview style podcast hosted by victims advocates, Kimberly Corbin Rourke, that's Michael's wife. They have a great story about how she was a victim when she met him. They go way back. It's really well done. And Kara Robinson Chamberlain. They talk about true stories of survival, healing, and hope beyond the headlines. The irony is in this episode from April 12th, 2023, chapter 11, prosecutorial vicarious trauma with the Honorable Michael J. Rourke. When the Weld County DA, Michael J. Rourke, discusses his highest profile cases and the moment he realized vicarious trauma had become a very real part of his life, revealing a much needed perspective for true crime consumers. Yes, we do have a lot to learn and I'm taking it all in, but I hope that's a symbiotic relationship. I hope law enforcement and district attorneys and everyone also takes in what we as a viewing public or consumers of true crime crime or constituents or whomever are saying back to them as well. There's a featured advertisement on Cured Nutrition on the Survivor's Guide to True Crime. It sounds like a minute long ad. Nothing wrong with that. It's very popular to do, of course, on YouTube, on podcasts, on Patreon, on Apple, wherever you listen to podcasts. Prior to talking about the Chris Watts case, they launch into this minute long ad. They're speaking of adaptogens on Cured.com. You know, they're talking about this Rise bundle, this Zen bundle. I see the bundles like about $120 or so or less, things that can help improve mental clarity and everything, and taking these gummies, how they can help consumers. Now, unless Michael Rourke's wife, of course, did this for free, which is doubtful, you know, many of us get paid for sponsorships, then hers is a monetized podcast as well, and that's what Rourke is appearing on. And he would go on later to also appear on a TED Talk, TED Times Mile High Transcend Virtual Premiere. So I've also linked to that below as well. Now, I don't believe those TED Talk speakers get paid, but it can bring in ancillary income, especially if you're later hired to become a speaker at different events or what have you. Now, I'm not sure if Rourke is going that route at all. It's very interesting that he made the statement about monetized podcasts and Dateline NBC and all those things and the people who want to make lifetime movies out of the Watts case, documentarians, and he's even going to talk about a YouTuber. I understand it runs the gamut some people go way in the extreme and others are just trying to understand the case. Like the women on the podcast talk about some people, we are so into true crime because we're trying to figure out why on earth did this happen? How on earth could a man like Chris Watts who chased Shanann and wanted her and went after her and finally got her and convinced her to date him and having three children, I'm calling Nico a child, even though Colorado would not recognize as Rourke talked about Nico as a child, that 
Chris Watts took off this earth. Having three children, why, how could a man who Shanann called her rock, that's the only rock I think of <laughs> right there, how could that go so wrong to the point where a man like Chris Watts would just do away with them so horribly? So Rourke won't say Watts's name. He's referring to it as the Frederick homicide. It can get graphic, so again, I'm only playing little snippets I found interesting. The podcast is more than an hour and a half long, so I recommend you go listen to it in its entirety. One thing that was curious that Behind Criminal Minds pointed out as well, I heard Michael Rourke talking about Shanann's parents. He said one parent wanted the death penalty. The other, Shanann's father, wanted us to make sure that this defendant never saw the light of day. Ultimately, the outcome of that was a split. I mean, one parent wanted the death penalty. The other, Shanann's father, um, wanted us to make sure that this defendant never saw the light of day. And ultimately, he did plead guilty to everything we charged him with in exchange for not seeking the death penalty. So it sounds like he's saying Shanann's mother wanted Chris to get the death penalty, which is a little reverse. I don't know if he got it flipped in his mind. I thought we were always led to believe that Shanann's mom and dad, especially her mom wanted to spare Chris's life. Well, this was especially before she heard the horrible details of Chris's confession in February, 2019. But Rourke talks about seeing those crime scene photos. He only got three or four in and he was like, I don't know, a black tunnel. He felt like he was gonna pass out and throw up and he couldn't do it anymore. And this is when they turn to talking about true crime sleuths. They wanna play detective from home they feel like they're part of the case. Now, Rourke did say that Shanann's family has been traumatized by producers who want to do Lifetime movies, reporters who want a soundbite from her mom. This is where Rourke started talking about a YouTuber in Scotland. He doesn't name him, but he said he requests records from the DA's office that Rourke says he refuses to release. I didn't put that part in. I'll let you go listen to those details. But he said the demand from the public for open records was crushing. Rourke's office made a link available through ShareFile, so many of us were able to download that. The number of people who downloaded the case files and info is stunning. Rourke said, we're talking about multiple tens of thousands of downloads. And then you hear this ugh of disgust, almost as if anyone who wanted to see the Chris Watts files, discovery, listen to interviews, read the discovery itself, see the photos, of course not the horrible photos, they're not going to release those really graphic ones like in the Gannon Stout case, I don't know how those got released, but just to learn about the crime, it was kind of like, ugh, almost condescending in certain ways. Although they did realize, look, a lot of us just want to know why this crime happened, and I believe it was Rourke's wife who rightly said, no matter how much we can read in the discovery, we won't see the why. We won't have that moment that is like, oh, that's the reason. That's where he flipped. That's why he did this. You have all of the media coverage. And, you know, this is one thing we talk about with true crime sleuths is that they'll want to go on and play detective from home. And Shanann's entire <laughs> profile is all public. And so you have countless hours of videos, pictures, posts, nuances, all kinds of things that they can go through and they feel like they are part of the case. When that happens, what does that do? I mean, to you as the prosecutor or the head of the office, what are some things that like people who are constantly doing this can take away from it? That happened, like I said, August 13th of 2018. It is now early 2023. Every single day since that homicide, Shanann's family has been tortured, re-victimized, traumatized by producers who want to do Lifetime movies and by reporters who want to scoop the rest of the country by getting a soundbite from Shanann's mom. Let me back up one step. In this case, it was a fairly short prosecution in that there wasn't a year-long investigation and a ton of follow-up interviews. So we still had four or five, maybe 6,000 pages of reports and cell phone downloads, photographs, all of those kinds of things. The Demand from the public, once his case was resolved, for open and complete access, either through Criminal Justice Records Act, FOIA requests in Colorado, it's called the Colorado Open Records Act, was crushing. I have an office of 80 employees, and I bet if we would have done this any other way, all 80 of my employees would have been responding to nothing but these requests. 
So we had to make the choice of making the files that we would release public available on our website, Office website, through a program called ShareFile, where people could simply request it, they'd get the link, and they could download, and they could sit at home and read. The number of people that have done that is stunning. We are talking multiple tens of thousands of downloads worldwide of this horrific crime that I have described. I wish I could say that's surprising, but I think one of the things that compels people with crimes like this, and I think true crime in general, is they see a crime like this and they go, how on earth does someone do something so heinous? And Mm -hmm. I think a large percentage of the population that consumes true crime, they consume it because they're trying to understand. But I think that the thing to remember is there is no excuse. There is no, how did someone get this way? You're not going to read this file and do anything other than vicariously traumatize yourself, basically. But Mm -hmm. people want to try to understand. I agree with that in part. I also have seen, from my perspective, the number of people who have wanted to play junior detective. Yeah, I think that's the other side of true crime as well. They want to play junior detective. They want to second guess charging decisions. They want to second guess whether or not the offender is truly guilty. They want to second guess the sentencing determination that I had to make. And in this one, in my description earlier, I didn't share this piece, but at the same time, we knew through the course of our investigation that the defendant was having an affair with somebody that he had met at work. And there was the significant belief by many that she played a role in this murder. The most recent email I have gotten demanding that I reopen the investigation and prosecute her for murder, I received last week. I bet conservatively, we have gotten five or 6,000 emails demanding the same thing, questioning the, the very decision-making process that we had gone through without having all the information. We get phone calls from people who say, you know, I want you to, to justify or articulate why you made this decision. And I'm not going to do that. I just refuse. I, it's gotten to the point where about two years ago, I finally decided I'm not doing any more interviews. I'm not doing any more documentaries. I'm not doing any made-for-TV movies. Nothing. I have got to get out of talking about this particular case. Thank you for being on our program. (laughs) And then you dragged me back in. (laughs) (laughs) And so, for clarity, that avenue has been investigated. It is closed. Period. That's it. So, stop asking about it. Stop asking about it. She didn't have anything to do with it. She wasn't there that morning. She voluntarily cooperated with law enforcement. She provided us all the information. I'm not going to tell you where she's at. Stop. Leave me alone. Because ultimately, she is a victim in ways as well. So right. leave her the hell alone. <laughs> like right. I mean, leave y- y'all alone about it. Leave her alone. And out of his own mouth again, was a very clear affirmation of what he had done. She didn't do it. She had nothing to do with it. Leave her alone. Right. Absolutely. But Rourke had said in April of 2023, when he was recording this podcast, the most recent email he had just gotten was a week prior to that podcast demanding that Nicole Kessinger be prosecuted for murder. He said conservatively, he's gotten five or 6,000 emails demanding the same thing, questioning the decision-making process without having all the evidence, and he's not going to justify his decision. So that's when he goes in to stop asking about it. She didn't have anything to do with it. She wasn't there that morning. She voluntarily cooperated with law enforcement. I am an evidence person too. I got these raw files directly from Weld County DA showing Chris Watts in the driveway. I watched the raw unedited files. I do believe I can see certain points where I believe Chris Watts is on the other side of his truck picking up one of his daughters that probably wandered outside. We all know it's hard to see off in that little corner. I personally never thought I saw Nicole Kessinger walking in the driveway, even though I leave room for people who I respect their decision if they think that's what they see. I don't see that. I couldn't be on a jury and convict Nicole Kessinger for being there based on trying to watch these videos. However, other evidence does make me question things. 
Like the neighbor Betty, we've gone over her video where she saw some type of truck that looked like Nicole's truck, not the white truck. I believe that's the one they rented when they went to the sand dunes. Nicole Kessinger's gray truck potentially parked near the Saratoga Trail home early that morning, August 13th, 2018. Rourke is saying she wasn't there that morning. And we know there was a ping in Frederick, Colorado that morning, but it was around 618 or so. So I get it. Those are evidence markers that I look for. Rourke said she voluntarily cooperated with law enforcement. She provided us all the information. Well, yes and no. We know Nicole Kessinger came forward that same day prior to Chris Watts confessing Wednesday, August 15th, 2018. The big question is why did she come forward and how did she come forward? She came forward with her dad in the park. There was a lot of subterfuge. There was a lot of misdirection. There was a lot of lying and she wasn't forthcoming. She broke her SIM card. She deleted text messages. So I wouldn't say that's providing us with all the information. These are the reasons sleuths like me are giving Nicole a side eye. That doesn't mean we think she ordered the hit or had any prior knowledge of the crimes. I'm not going that far. I'm just saying I don't know. There were things that just stopped. The investigation stopped when Chris Watts pled guilty. And maybe it's okay. Maybe that's where it should have stopped. Now this is a lot different than Rourke in his original press conference after Chris Watts pled guilty when he described how Nicole actually hampered the investigation by deleting everything off her phone between her and Chris Watts and Rourke said I believe that for the most part she was forthcoming she originally came forward and, and spoke to investigators on her own volition prior to the time unfortunately that she came in and spoke with investigators she had deleted all of the information off of her phone that had any connection between her and Chris Watts that hampered the investigation um, that hampered our ability to get that electronic digital um, connection between the two she was interviewed on multiple occasions. I believe that for the most part she was forthcoming in the course of those investigations. Uh, we don't have any reason to believe that she had any prior knowledge or involvement in the death of Shanann Bella, Celeste, and Nico. Um, I think that's the best way to answer that. But at this point, Rourke seems fed up. By last year, he said, I'm not going to tell you where she's at. Now, I don't blame him for that. Of course, there are some people out there that they can get amped up. They can watch things online. They can watch all these anonymous theories and get all crazed and start driving cross country looking again for some kids being held in a pizza parlor in the basement when there is no basement. I get what he's saying. I get why he would not want to tell anyone where Nicole is. I'm assuming he knows her new name. I'm assuming he's kept track of her because he would have to if he were to ever bring any charges against her. But I don't think that means he has to shut his ear to everyone who is just questioning some of her actions. Stop, leave me alone, he says. And one of the women says, because ultimately she is a victim in ways as well so leave her the hell alone she didn't do it she had nothing to do with it leave her alone nicole could be a victim for sure she may have had no idea chris watts was going to do what he did now people don't see her totally as a victim because of all her lying because of the way she acted in the interviews because of her lack of empathy and sympathy for shenan and her children and their plight her inappropriate behavior her self-protection and all of that but people just wonder how was she deemed a victim and a protected witness so quickly before cops even got the lowdown about nicole at all Michael Rourke describes that he's been accused of accepting bribes, you know, not to prosecute Nicole. He's still waiting on that check. He's claiming, oh yeah, I've been getting allegedly $80,000 not to prosecute her. Hell, I've been accused of accepting bribes <laughs> from her, the mistress, from her family not to prosecute her. Uh, I'm still waiting for that check. Apparently I'm getting paid $80,000 not to prosecute her. Uh, <laughs> Kim, let me know when that check comes through. Yeah, we're putting it towards my student loans. Best thing that a secondary supporter can do is simply start by believing what a person says unless and until you are confronted with contrary compelling information. Does that make sense? That was very lawyer of you, but yes, it does. <laughs> no, but it's good. What I, I really want to say, I mean... Let's be honest. What I really want to say is quit being jerks. Quit quit trying to think that you on your couch behind an anonymous keyboard knows better than those of us who are professionals in the field who are always going to ascribe to us a motive to do something that is unethical, immoral, or illegal. We're doing our level best and, and quit trying to think that you know better than we do because you have some preconceived notion about law enforcement or prosecutors. That's what I really want people to do. <laughs> Let us do our jobs. It's fair. It's fair. Use that if you want. That's what really grinds my gears. Uh. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> and if you are that passionate about solving crimes, guess what? There are places you can volunteer. You can actually go just work in law enforcement if you want to give it a shot. I mean, you can try. Mm-hmm. So if you're that passionate yeah. about it, then follow that passion. Right. Then the criminal justice system needs you. Yeah. Yeah. There because- are prosecutors' offices all over this country who need attorneys. Yep. Who are short staffed and doing our level best to handle the crush of cases. Go to law school and get a degree and become a prosecutor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're not gonna get paid a whole lot, but you can imagine you're gonna be doing it for the right reasons. Exactly. And that I mean that's what makes the difference, right? Like nobody gets into law enforcement work or any of any of these avenues because they want to make a million dollars. Right. Mm-hmm. They do it because they have a passion. They want to help people. They want to solve crimes. And so if you feel that way, then go do it. Absolutely. So how about it? All right. So I get what he means. I can't imagine being in his position and just dealing with crazy lies and rumors that people make up out of nowhere. I don't like when people make up theories just as a plot point, just to have something to talk about. I like when there's some type of thread of evidence to go with something. But Rourke says, believe what a person says until you're confronted with contrary info. If he would just follow those words, we initially may have believed Nicole Kessinger was this, you know, damsel in distress, She was like an Amber Fry type. Oh my goodness, she had no idea. Chris Watts was married. Poor Nicole. But that narrative swiftly changed as many of us got into the case and we could count all the lies. We could count all the red flags. And the question was, is Nicole lying just to salvage her reputation, just to save face? That's one thing. Or was she deleting evidence, misleading law enforcement, not telling them about the secret calculator app? They didn't find it till months later, May 22nd, 2019. I can remember that date. That is the date of the folder of all these Nikki and Chris photos and other stuff that came out much later after the initial discovery because it took cops so long to find it because she didn't tell them about it. It was the hidden secret calculator app where they exchanged all these photos and stuff. The big question is why did Nikki do that? Of course she didn't want her photos splashed everywhere. She didn't want her name to be mud. She didn't want to have to go into hiding. She didn't want to be known as the scarlet letter A person. I can understand that. If she would have come out and taken her lumps like, oh my goodness, yeah, I knew he was married. I'm sorry, but I had nothing to do with the crime and just been more remorseful and just less witchy, I think people would have had a lot more sympathy for her. She could have been out and walking around today because the whole viewpoint of Nikki would have been different. This is where the podcast becomes a little bit condescending. Quit thinking behind your keyboard that you know better than the professionals. Go to law school, get a degree, and become a prosecutor. Now, a lot of that I do agree with. Some people, younger people, older people, who knows? They might get inspired by watching cases like this. If they think a person has gotten it wrong or they see injustice, that might lead them to want to go to law school, become a lawyer, don't become a prosecutor they're saying on this podcast because it doesn't pay much become a law enforcement officer hopefully people will do it all for the right reasons and they fight for the greater good even if we all make mistakes here and there whether you're a youtuber or you know trying to research these crimes or you're a prosecutor you're a defense attorney what have you everyone might make little mistakes here and there but the main goal is to get justice and try and walk in righteousness as much as possible and if you screw up you screw up but it was condescending. You know, I was thinking social media sleuths like us can be very helpful, like in the Savannah Soto case. You know, we watch each other. I watch a lot of different YouTubers and I was watching, I've been researching Savannah Soto case and Matthew Guerra since they went missing. Since I first heard about it, I made a video on Christmas Day, they were still missing. Then I watched a live video a couple of days later or what have you that Ikit Mel was doing. This is when the San Antonio Police Department released that surveillance video and I was watching a lot of people were commenting saying whoa I see something in that surveillance video someone's throwing a towel there must be a third person there and so that helped me watch it closer because I hadn't necessarily seen that until other viewers you know when you have thousands of viewers people will pick up on things that others do not I was like yeah I do see that towel going like that so since it became such a big thing and now San Antonio police have said well yeah we've seen that too it very well could be a third person we don't know who all they're interviewing or what have you. At least the cops said, we're looking into that. They didn't say, oh, you silly social media sleuths. There's nothing in that video. You know, stop being these keyboard warriors and detectives. 
And perhaps San Antonio police may not have even seen that towel flopping like, like I didn't see it until viewers brought it to their attention. So there can be this helpful symbiotic relationship that shouldn't be poo-pooed. You know, law enforcement should never take the stance or should a DA should never take the stance of, don't you worry, I got this. You guys stop being so much into true crime and stop monetizing this pain and, and stop being voyeurs and it doesn't need to be that attitude. We can look at it as a community of people all trying to help solve a case, not by giving far-fetched theories, not by bothering victims and their families, having tact, yes, and empathy and sympathy, but all looking at it as a way to help each other. Not like, you're a bother, leave me alone. That's what I think can come of this case. I think the goal is don't treat every social media sleuth as some idiot out there spouting off all these wild conspiracy theories that couldn't possibly be true. Now with Nicole Kessinger, should she be bullied or, you know, harassed or? No, I don't think so. I just believe she was not thoroughly investigated. Lots of people don't either. If they're getting thousands and thousands and thousands of emails and thousands of signatures on all these petitions, I don't think it helps to dig your heels in and say, that's it. We looked into her. I'm not going to tell you all the evidence, but we know she didn't do anything. She didn't know anything. That's it. Case closed. I think that's a stance that you don't necessarily want to take because it's not listening to your constituents. It's not listening to the public's desires. And indeed, if the investigation had continued into her, they very well could find even more evidence. Nope, she had nothing to do with it. Jim, her friend, admitted, yes, they were here and here's the proof or all of that. There's nothing wrong with becoming humble, listening to others. However, in cases like this where people feel there's some kind of injustice or with me, it's just unsurety. I don't know what the heck she was hiding. I only know God knows. And in cases where people see glaring inconsistencies, glaring injustice, I feel like those wrongs will be righted someday. Like you see people who have been incarcerated decades, I can't even imagine, 30 years, and eventually they're exonerated. You know, DNA proves them innocent. Or in the reverse, like cases like I believe O.J. Simpson. I feel like he got away with a crime, but he won't get away with it forever. Eventually he tripped himself up and he ended up going to jail anyway. Of course not for murder, but he did do a stint in prison. My thing is, God always finds a way to right wrongs and to bring justice. He won't leave it unanswered forever. Maybe God just knows internally if Nicole had nothing to do with nothing. Or if he knows differently, he'll know how to handle it one day. And that's got to be the worst kind of prison if a person is living with guilt, hasn't repented, know they know more than what they're saying. Ugh. That would be worse. But we always just want justice for victims. Check out all the links below and you can watch all the videos I'm talking about referencing. You can listen to the whole podcast if you so desire. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against you will succeed and you will condemn every tongue that accuses you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. So if Nicole Kessinger needs some kind of vindication, she'll get it. You know, if she's being wrongly accused, and I know she can be like an easy mark, she's the mistress, she's the quote-unquote homewrecker, she's the woman where people didn't like her voice, they didn't like her persona, they didn't like her affect, they did not like a lot of things about her. And another thing too, this crime was so horrible and so egregious that people poured out so much wrath on Chris Watts, rightly so. Maybe they just wanted another person to keep pouring their wrath out on. I know that could be part of it. But for the calmly thinking, measured people who know how to just view evidence for what it's worth, and we noticed, you know, tons of inconsistencies, there's nothing wrong with just asking questions. Just asking, well, wait a minute, are you sure this is right? Are you sure no one else should be prosecuted? There's nothing wrong with that. And if the answer, the evidence leads you to no, then it's no. Maybe forever, maybe not. Once that person meets their maker, or like in the Savannah Soto case, maybe they will eventually find a third person who was there and had knowledge of the crime and might need to be brought to justice. 
Maybe not. There's nothing wrong with web sleuths looking at the evidence, examining true crime, and helping authorities, not hindering authorities, helping the case come to its fruition. It's just like crowdsourcing crime sleuthing. For all the departments who don't have enough officers to go through these videos frame by frame and see some of the things we see, it can just be a help. So stay tuned for more coverage of this case and many other current cases. Take care.